we have our, our live content API that allows, uh, you know, sort of like pushing those changes into the end user experiences uh, effectively. And, you know, I think a week before the event, someone came up with that idea and we're like, yeah, let's do it. We can totally do this. And someone was like, I'm going to build a demo uh, to make it work. And, you know, you could just like work really flexibly. And I think in big tech, you would be like, we have already locked in the script and uh, yeah, yeah, has to yeah. go through this many layers of approvals to see like, can, you know, can we make this change? No, this is fun. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. And that's just a super fun culture. And Today's guest is Rachel Potvin. Rachel is Senior VP of Engineering at Sanity. And before that, she was VP of Engineering at GitHub and Director of Engineering at Google. With Rachel, we talked about her journey across what feels like different generations of companies. We talked about challenges, lessons learned, and the great work she's doing at Sanity right now. So let's dive right into it after a short word from our sponsor. Visor is the easy way to align your team. Create Jira roadmaps, spreadsheets, and capacity planning charts that you can share with anyone using Visor's bidirectional Jira integration. Visor is always free to get started with, no credit card needed. Get started at visor.us today. Hey, Rachel, welcome, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi, Luca, thanks. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. So, Rachel, you're a senior VP of engineering at Sanity, but this is just the latest step of an incredible career in tech where you worked at GitHub, at Google, and others. So one of the things that looked the most interesting to me in your journey is how you worked in what feels like different generations even of companies and companies at different scale from, from Google to GitHub to Sanity. So different eras, different teams. Uh, and so one of the themes for this chat uh, that I would love to explore is how you went through these experiences, lessons you have learned and similarities and differences maybe uh, between the, the, these very different companies. Uh, so maybe we can start with Google where you stayed for more than 10 years, right? So how, how was the experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you for your, your kind words, Luca. And that, that sounds like a great, uh, great approach to this podcast. So Google, yeah, I was there for 11 and a half years. At some point I thought I was wow. a lifer for sure. Yeah. I think you get really sort of Google is sort of that, you know, big company feeling where you, you get so immersed in the culture. And, you know, I have to say Google was such an interesting place when I was there. I started in 2008 and it was actually, you know, very insular, I'm going to say. Uh, mm. So I, I found at least when I was at Google, I, you sort of thought that Google was the center of the world and you sort of thought that all the best stuff, the most interesting engineering work was definitely happening at Googler, at Google. Um, I felt like, you know, we could do anything that we set our mind to, which is a really empowering feeling, of course. Um, but once you're on the outside of that, you realize, oh, wait a minute. Okay, of course, interesting <laughs> and exciting work is happening everywhere. And um, it's actually funny how many ex-Googlers I've talked to where we realized we were sort of like even almost isolated from what was going on in open source. And we didn't, you know, I didn't start uh, talking to other startups or investing in other startups until after I left Google because it was yeah. such an insular uh, culture. Yeah. But it's kind of funny. Uh, the story of how I ultimately decided to leave was, um, you know, I had spent eight or so years in infrastructure at Google. And my last three years, I moved to Google Cloud. A lot of fun. I was uh, building the insights and recommendations platform, uh, establishing the GCP data organization. And at that time, I was also still managing Google's developer productivity research team, one of my, one of my favorite teams and such, a, such an interesting team doing such great work. Um, and in that role, I was pulled into some of the conversations that were happening with GitHub uh, as Google Cloud was attempting to acquire GitHub. So wow. everyone should know at this point that that acquisition was not actually successful. Microsoft yeah. <laughs> uh, won that battle. But that was a little bit of a heads up moment for me to start thinking more about GitHub and like, gosh, wouldn't it be exciting to be working on developer productivity for the world instead of just, you know, this group of 
of developers within um, within uh, Google. And then also, as often happens, you know, in your life, there's other things going on in my head. And I think this is a pretty pretty common story too. Is that um, so? At Google, I'd been working in a director of engineering role for mm -hmm. multiple years, and I was on a leadership team with all other directors and even senior directors. And um, and yet, I hadn't got my official promotion to that level yet. So Google does retroactive promotions. So I felt like, oh, I'm doing this job, but I haven't been promoted yet. And so that was a little little poke mm. too that was mm, kind mm, of mm. annoying and so that also created this heads up moment for me to be like oh maybe it's time to start thinking of things outside of google and so ultimately i did i did get that promo as i was sort of leaving um but at that point i feel like you know your heart moves on and my heart had already moved yeah. on to the exciting challenge at github and so that's that's uh, that's where i ended up yeah going. and and what was that uh excited you the most about GitHub? Was it the culture, people you had been in, in, in touch with, maybe uh, along with the conversations for acquisition or the, the challenges, uh, the, the, the high growth startup vibes? It was, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of things, but I think having been at Google for so long, I was there for 11 years, I had the insecurity, of course, like I'm doing well at, at Google and Google, yeah. you know, recognizes that and wants me to stay in like, this is a whole new environment. Will I be successful there too? Uh, you yeah. know, it was my first foray into working in open source. There were a lot of things about uh, GitHub culture that were surprising to me in terms of um, coming from a big company. Like, I think I told this story on another podcast about, uh, you know, some products not being built in cloud, but being built on prem. Uh, mm. And, you know, engineers on my team getting machines racked in GitHub data centers and running out of capacity. And I was sort of like, that's not a problem that I've ever heard of in my <laughs> past 11 years, right? So there was definitely a lot of interesting challenges there, but the, the motivation was really about the excitement of the mission of GitHub. And, you know, even today, I mean, I work at a, a, a growth stage startup and I do advising at startups and everyone relies on GitHub. And so GitHub putting energy and effort into improving developer experience is something that's felt around the world. And I, I just found that incredibly motivating and, and inspiring. Yeah, I, I think for, for any engineer working on tools for engineers, it's like the dream come true. I mean, it's what you would even do, you know, in your regular job as an IC, you'd love to do that. And being able to do that all the time uh, for, as a living for, for your job is, uh, it, it has to feel amazing. So you joined GitHub as uh, VP of Engineering and you stayed there yeah. uh, for uh, about four years, I think, three, three years. and something yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, what, how was the experience? What are your favorite accomplishments and lessons you're, you've learned there? Um, GitHub, uh, GitHub was a great place. It was a, a bit of a wild ride, you know. I. I came in and my team was, you know, about a hundred to start. Immediately there was an acquisition that joined my team. Mm. Um, and then we also GitHub did this sort of reverse merger with part of Microsoft. So the okay. Azure DevOps team was um, sort of working on in a similar space to GitHub and very logically, instead of being competitive, uh, you know, let's merge these teams. And so a bunch of excellent folks came over from Microsoft. Uh, from Azure DevOps, joined my org. Uh, you know, I had this uh, substantial acquisition of this company called Semel. Uh, mm. And then, of course, uh, OG hubbers uh, yeah. and lots and lots of new hires. So the team grew to, my team grew to over 500 engineers in an organization of, I would say, around 1,200, um, where I was managing wow. a lot of uh, product engineering, in fact, most of it. And um, so, you know, there were, tons of great product accomplishments for my team over my time there. I would say, you know, back to the acquisition of Semmel. Semmel, just a fantastic startup, and it formed the basis of GitHub's advanced security product area, which mm. was a brand new product area that was a really, really fun and inspiring team to work with. And that effort went from, you know, zero revenue to over 100 million ARR in under three years, which is just such a wild and exciting journey. I got it. Give a shout out to Semmel's CEO, Uga de Moore, also just a, a brilliant person who also led the research team that brought GitHub Copilot to life. So um, that was really, really fun to work with that group. My team also launched Codespaces. Um, wow. Once Copilot came out of research, it 
joined my org and we we launched Copilot. Um, you know, one of my favorite smaller projects was we um, we worked on a vastly improved code search and navigation experiences, uh, which really, you know, I think was a super, super fun initiative and very, very uh, novel yes. engineering work as well. But, you know, as I'll, I'll say all the time, and I think I've said in other forums, my favorite work at GitHub was often less about the specific project milestones or product launches that we had, but really about uh, building a healthier engineering organization, healthy practices, strong engineering culture, um, which really enabled a lot of the a lot of the great launches to happen. And yeah. uh, so that was, you know, a lot of fun and something that I look back on very fondly. Yeah, for sure. And I, I... I go back to what you said at the beginning that you, you joined and there were there was this acquisition going on and there was the Microsoft acquisition. So there were the original hubbers, there were the people from yeah. Azure. And, and so sometimes um, we feel that it's not easy, you know, to, to, to make sure that the cultures do not clash. And seen from the outside, yeah. the, the, the way the GitHub acquisition has been handled for Microsoft has been very successful. I mean, GitHub has yeah. thrived and grown a lot. So uh, seeing this from the, ans the, the inside, uh, well, how what, how would you attribute this success to? I mean, how this was handled, and you think uh, what are some you know, lessons think, learned yeah. from that? It's it's interesting. I will I'll tell you this is I, I don't want this to sound uh, like boasting at all, but I I have huge respect for Satya Nadella, and I feel like he's just been a phenomenal CEO of Microsoft. And I was really torn about leaving Google. I have to be honest, Google made it very hard on me to leave. And I wasn't sure, I, but my heart was already at GitHub, but you know, logically it started, started to get very complicated. And um, when I was deciding, I got an email from Satya and he, he wow. said he cares so much about developer productivity and uh, he really thinks I could come and help uh, work uh, on the culture and on the products and so on. And that, uh, I remember the moment very clearly because it was on a weekend and I was by a friend's pool with my kids and I just told them, oh, someone really famous just emailed me. <laughs> and I know it's a it's a recruiting tactic that people use, pull in the CEO and ask, ask them, but like, I, I got to say works. that definitely pushed me over the edge for sure. I was like, Satya thinks I can help. I really want to help. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that like leadership from the top was was very careful about the GitHub brand and yeah. uh, about sort of maintaining that independence. Um, but more and more, of course, over time, like uh, when I arrived at GitHub, most of GitHub, you know, there was stuff running on-prem, like I said, but also on AWS uh, and nothing was running on Azure. And and so it was pretty natural for, um, you know, Amy yeah, had the CFO at a certain point to be like, come on, people, yeah. we got to run on Azure. We can like, do better probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we had to sort of make those migrations. And then with all the Azure DevOps people coming in, like GitHub Actions is a fantastic product. And it's mo it's it, it was a az Azure Pipelines, I think, uh, that was sort of rebranded and brought over to GitHub. And so there was some really nice collaborations that made a ton of sense that made GitHub more powerful. Um, Copilot also is very much a, a Microsoft uh, collaboration. Um, but I think uh, sort of maintaining that 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 separation while benefiting from the advantages was a, a very healthy mix, not yeah. without challenges, right? But a healthy mix. No, of course, but you, you know, challenges are always there. But many times we, uh, you know, we think that all these. Um, big acquisitions from big tech are destined to fail. You know, you start, you lose the startup culture, yeah. all these things. Yeah. While well, instead we have many counter examples, I have to say, especially from Microsoft, they've done many of them over the years that mm -hmm. are doing extremely well. Uh, so, so I mean, props to, I had to be given where they're given. So totally. You, totally. Yeah, so you, you, you have said that you, other than the great product you work, you, you take pride in, in building healthy engineering practices and, and a strong engineering culture during your tenure. So what kind of work uh, did you do on that side and what kind of improvements were you able to, to bring with the team? I'll have to like scrape my brain on that one, but um, <laughs> there, there are things like, uh, you know, there wasn't, um, there weren't real engineering ladders. So I think, you know, writing that yeah. uh, and, and publishing that out and sort of socializing that and sort of like talking to the engineering organization that was moving from startup to being sort of a, a big company, right? And that sort of thing you need at a big company. So I did that kind of work. 
Um, I did things like establishing something which I called, I think I called it the engineering council or the principal principles. Uh, and what I was seeing was, um, you know, and this is something at my current job that I established as well. Um, but sometimes there's these really tough decisions that just don't get made and uh, really important stuff. And that's just, um, I think the biggest killer to productivity is when you have a decision that's not really owned and it's sort of floating around the organization and people are angsty about it and worried about it. I think one of the decisions we brought to that council at GitHub was whether or not to um, go all in on moving to React. And that mm. was just a tough decision that no individual engineer or no individual team could make. Uh, you had to like sort of surface it up and get the pros and cons on the table and then make a coherent decision about it. Um, so doing that was was definitely something uh, that I thought was uh, really valuable as well. Um, and just uh, lots of ways in, in which uh, I think I set up operational reviews and, um, you know, uh, talked a lot about developer productivity. I remember I, I published an engineering strategy, which was yeah. separate from our, our um, product strategy. It was like, what are the things we're investing in, in terms of security and uh, engineering productivity and KTLO, um, you know, there was lots of work. GitHub had, had a massive Ruby on Rails monolith and uh, the deployment process was just uh, getting to be abysmal. Like people in my team were coming to me and saying like, I don't even want to try to start a deployment until if it's after lunch, because I might be stuck till after dinner. And like mm. the, the effect on developer productivity for that is so serious. So there were some really smart engineers who pro proposed Componentizing the the monolith, and that was an inch council uh, discussion that we had as well to kind of do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Were you able to improve on the on the shipping on the release process to to make it linear, componentizing things? Yeah, there were a lot of people working on that problem. Um, I think a, a big aspect to that problem was uh, GitHub is um, GitHub.com, where open source mm. lives, is uh, you know our main deploy target, and I think in the startup world. Uh, you know, that's what all engineers thought about was let's get it out to github.com. But GitHub also has an enterprise product um, and the enterprise products, uh, you know, I'm, it's, it's been a year and a half since I've been there now, so I'm not speaking for them at all. But there were a lot of work on that. And the idea of taking um, code that was, you know, deployed on github.com and releasing that to the enterprise product, well, it's not one enterprise product. It's yeah. You know, it's like multiple different environments for different customers. So yeah. uh, it's kind of easy to have a deployment process that works in a certain way when you have one deployment target, but when you have N, that starts to break. And so we were at a point at GitHub where in order to, for um, enterprise customers to upgrade their GitHub enterprise instances, they needed to have downtime to be able to like catch so they yeah. couldn't stay alive, which is just not acceptable in this modern age, right? So there was yeah. tons of work being done to figure out how can we have no downtime, continuous deployment across all these N different environments uh, when we had really been built to deploy to one environment. So that was yeah. a, a huge struggle. Yeah, I, I, I've heard many stories of uh, startups starting in the consumer space and then trying to, to to address enterprises and that changes everything when it comes to uh, releases, to processes. It's a different bar that you need to clear on many things. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so I, I get the struggle. And, and so I, I guess that many of these changes were prompted by the, the high growth, right, during that time period. Yeah. How much did the team grew from when you joined to, to, to when you eventually lived? My team went from about 100 to about 500. And I think wow. engineering went from probably, I, I feel like it, I feel like it might've tripled in size. Just with wow. you, when you talk about bringing in the Azure DevOps folks, the acquisitions that were made as well as the hiring, it was just a very, very high growth, high growth yeah. moment. Was that, was that a struggle as well? I mean, I guess spending a lot of time in hiring, reworking processes that maybe work at some, at a certain number of people that don't work anymore, you know, the the common struggles of companies going through hyper yeah. growth. I mean, if I could look back on it, we shouldn't have hired as much, right? Like mm. it was, um, hiring was very costly and very difficult. And we, um, we had, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Marco had set up, um, 
has set up a, we called it our always on hiring pipeline. And we were just seeing cohorts of people every week that we were interviewing. And we were, so there were three of us uh, sort of running engineering, Marco, myself, and my colleague, Jacob, who's running uh, platform and infrastructure. And each of us would take responsibility for one week's cohort and get people from our org to interview. And it was sort of like a massive logistical operational thing to get all those interviews happening um, while also trying to ensure that the cohorts were appropriately diverse and, um, you know, that we were thinking about the various levels of people that we wanted to bring in and stuff. So yeah. that was, that was definitely a big challenge. And wh- when you say you wouldn't hire that many people anymore, you mean that in hindsight, even back then, probably it was better it to It was very slower? costly. And I think, yeah. uh, it's hard for teams to sort of stabilize and get work done when you constantly have new team members coming in. But after I left GitHub, there were also layoffs. And so uh, I feel like that's something really, really sad and really hard. Um, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm thankful that uh, it wasn't something that I had to figure out because figuring out layoffs is extremely difficult. Um, and so, you know, I think a lesson learned for me is always being really thoughtful and cautious about hiring and not getting in front of your skis, if you will, yeah. uh, because, um, you know, no one wants to go through layoffs. That's just a... Uh, uh, morale killer and, yeah. and, and, you know, very hard on the people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So it, it feels like you had a wonderful time at GitHub. So I have to ask, what, why did you decide to leave? Anything you can share, of course, what was the thought process uh, from you deciding to, to leave GitHub, eventually joining Sanity? Uh, yeah. How did it go? Yeah, yeah. I would say I had a a four years at GitHub and I had a fantastic three years. And my last year, I I just kind of stopped having fun. Uh, You Mm. know, GitHub, it it just got so big that I I didn't even know a lot of the people on my team, which I, you know, I really like people and like something that really energizes me about engineering management is, you know, talking about ideas and talking to really smart developers and, and helping them piece things together and think about the big picture and so on. And I sort of didn't have as much of an opportunity to do that. Um, For the first time in my career, I was managing VPs and I was managing senior directors. And that's, that's a really interesting transition because at that point, you're not the face of your organization, you're a behind the scenes leader. And uh, so I would be more behind the scenes coaching other VPs on how they could be successful. And they were the faces of their leadership org. And so that's something I really had to reconcile was like, I always had to sort of um, build them up and be a little bit more behind the scenes. But that also meant that my role was dealing with a lot more politics and a lot more bureaucracy and just being a lot further away from the hands-on work that was being done, which is kind of the motivating, yeah. exciting stuff. Um, you know, for a long time in my career, I think this is maybe like a type A thing or maybe a thing that we fall into sometimes where it's just like, I want more, I want more, I want more responsibility. Yeah. What else can I do? What else can I do? And what, it's like, why do we, why do we want that? You know, I, I started to really reflect that I wasn't feeling happy and that's yeah. really what matters. And if, if ever I feel like what's happening in my workday is bleeding over into my life with my family and I'm being snippy or not sleeping yeah. well or something like that, then I know there's a problem. And, and, and so it was starting to get like that. Uh, GitHub leadership had changed in my last year. It was more and more embedded in Microsoft. And there, so there was more and more bureaucracy stuff coming from mm. Microsoft, which you know made, made sense, but also wasn't super fun. Um, I stopped feeling as aligned and as passionate about my role. And then I even got into the point where I was like dreading some meetings and, yeah. and interactions and... Um, mm. You know, just, I think, you know, this, I had a a kind of like a a moment where I was in a meeting and someone was just yelling and yelling at me. And I just, I just hung up. I was like, no, I just, (laughs) and like, that's not a, that's not a a way to, to, you know, like have a great time at your company. But, uh, after hanging up, my, my husband actually came into my office because he had heard the racket and he was like, going on you know you don't have to deal with that and I feel like that just kind of snapped me out of my kind of blind commitment because I had I had drunk the Kool-Aid for GitHub so hard and I still believe so much in the mission of uh, GitHub and uh, you know there's still so many great people there but you know I'd always been selling to my team this is you know here's what we're doing and here's our mission and I was just kind of 
stuck on it myself. And, and that moment kind of snapped me out of it and made me realize like, wait a minute, I'm not happy. I, re I really need to consider my options. And, you know, a lot had changed. Like we talked about all the growth. It was different leadership. Even, even when I left, I, I felt like there was a moment, a big moment of change at GitHub. Like I think more than half of my, I, I think I had 10 direct reports at the time and more than half of them left uh, within a couple of months of me leaving. My PM partners have all since left. I think more of my direct report, most of, I think maybe there might be two of my original direct reports that are still there. So, you know, th there was a lot of change and that's okay. Like it's a different, a different chapter of GitHub, but it just, it was no longer, you know, that, that right, yeah. right step for me. So do you think, do you, oh, can I, can I ask a question? Because oh, yeah. we, we hear, I, I've heard many stories of people get into VP roles, very high roles that get feel like they're more and more removed by the work that they love, more into yeah. politics and bureaucracy. And this happens especially, you know, big, big companies, big tech. Yeah. Do you think like this is inevitable? That is, I mean, you have, you have been at GitHub, you've been at Google. I mean, it makes me feel that there has to be a better way for companies <laughs> to, you know, organize themselves that ending up basically looking at their most talented individuals, doing things that look nothing like the things they're passionate about, right? So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting, Luca. I, I, I feel your question because like, you have to pick it. And there's some things I really enjoyed about being a VP and all the sort of, I used to say to my team, 50% of my job is working on the teams I'm working on. And 50% of my job is thinking about engineering as a whole and how are we productive. Yeah. And I'm kind of, I've always loved that stuff, but uh, I think it's good to be, have clarity about what you want. And I'm, you know, I've fought a battle my whole life. I'm such a people pleaser and I find it very hard sometimes to separate out what I actually want from what people want of me or expect of me or need from yeah. me. One of the reasons I think, you know, I, I, I say I'm really an introvert, although I like, I play an extrovert on zoom, uh, is that. I know when I'm by myself that I'm actually doing what I want most of the time. Whereas when I'm with other people, I have to sometimes like really try to understand like how much is of what I'm choosing to do is because that's what they want from me. Yeah. And so um, I think a VP role can be an amazing role. It can be a great role. But we also, and I've seen you talk about this in, in your work, we're also having a movement, I think, where we're moving. And maybe it's just my perception for being in, in a startup. Right. But yeah. I do feel like we're moving to having uh, engineering managers who are much more um, uh, close to their team, who are yeah. sort of embedded, highly, highly technical, flatter organizations. My organization at Sanity is super flat. All the all the engineering managers report to me and it'll be a really long time before I add any leveling or layer of hi hierarchy in there uh, when I talk mm. to engineering managers who are going to join my team and they ask about their growth path at Sanity, I'm like, you're going to have an amazing growth path because we are a startup that's doing really well. Yeah. And you get to be on that journey and see how that goes. But if you're looking to manage managers, don't, don't come here. That's not, I'm not yeah. building a layered organization because I don't, I don't want the kind of bureau bureaucratic jobs where like, what even is that person's role? And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think, but some people, you know, like, I know excellent people who are VPs and I had a good three years of really enjoying a, being a VP as well. So I don't think it's yeah. a doomed role, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm an SVP of engineering now, right? So I have a team, not nearly so big as my team at GitHub, but a wonderful, talented team. And I really enjoy doing everything I can to make that organization successful. Yeah. That's a very thoughtful answer. Uh, I guess it depends on so many things and even what you want yeah. to do, what you want from your role. So um totally agree and and you've mentioned sanity i mean i want to ask you so many things uh, about it so how did you eventually choose uh sanity uh there is i mean and what's uh, what's interesting to me is it's, it's really you know the thought process of a highly yeah, accomplished yeah. executive you know you're living a big company like github and you you're going for, for a different thing which is a high growth startup so what goes through your mind how do you make a decision and how was it for you well, yeah. And I'll step back for a sec and just say, like, as I was leaving GitHub, I, I, I knew like this, look, I'm not happy. And I'm in a position of privilege. Honestly, I've worked for more than 25 years in tech. 
grinding away. And, you know, if I wanted to retire, that's an option that's available to me. And it, it, it actually crossed my mind, right? Do I want to just lean into startup advising or, um, you know, board seats or, or whatever? Um, and then um, there's actually this, this fantastic startup that I'm an early investor in called Engflow. You might have heard of it. Uh, they're doing really great work in the build and test space. So it's very much a developer productivity team. Helen and Ulf are the founders and their former colleagues of mine from uh, Google. Just fantastic, fantastic people. You you should have one of them on your podcast because they're yeah. just great. Well, you should um, reach out to them. Yeah, awesome. Um, but uh, this is probably about a year and a half ago now. They came to, to where I live and they actually, the engineering team came and they did a hackathon at my house. And wow. um, awesome. I got to say that they were, it was so inspiring. I was like dealing with all this bureaucracy and politics and just uh, feeling so weighed down. And then I got to see these folks just like whiteboarding and laughing and having fun and being so excited about how they were going to change the world for developers. And, you know, they've, they've ramped up their team hugely since then, and they're just doing incredibly well. Um, but that, you know, seeing that, I was jealous. I was like, oh my gosh, they're having so much fun. And I kind of had an epiphany of like, I want that. I want to try mm. the startup journey. You know, I moved from, from Canada to the US in 2008, lived in Silicon Valley for 12 years or something before I moved out. Now I'm in, now I'm in Denver, but uh, I, you know, I, I never, I never really, you know, as a startup in, uh, in college, I worked for a startup, um, you know, briefly back in the dot-com boom, but I never, I never went on that journey of a startup. Mm. And I thought that's something that's missing from my portfolio. I've done, you know, I've, I've been an IC, I've been a manager of ICs, I've been a manager, manager, I've been a manager of like five levels deep and, yeah. you know, worked at these great software companies, but I've never had this journey and it, it's really, it's really pretty special. So that was kind of my thinking, but then it was like going from there. Okay. But where, right. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I put down a bunch of criteria about what I wanted and I tried to be really clear to myself of what I was looking for. And, you know, some of it was like, I want to be somewhere where I can help. Right. Like I want to feel like I'm doing something useful with my time and then, and then I'm being helpful. But um, the big criteria that I wrote down and I, I put it down and I, I have to say, I, I talked to so many people. I spoke to many, many startups. I leaned in and started doing more advising for startups, which was fun to sort of like get the, the vibe of startups. I reached out to former colleagues. I met with several great VC leaders. Um, I got to meet Martin Casado, who's an investor at Engflow. So I got that, you know, through connections, you sort of found people to talk to talked about their portfolios. I met with some talent agencies as well, really to kind of learn what was out there. You and did your I, homework. I, I did, I did. And I, I, I took time, right? I took time to think about it. Um, being in a, I have to say again, position of privilege that I, I sort of got to choose and I could be picky yeah. and I didn't have to take a job if I didn't want a job, right? Yeah. So that was a really lucky, um, fortunate, I should say, position to be in. So. I would say my number one criteria, well, they're all kind of like important for different reasons, but like I was very focused on the leadership team. Mm. You know, you spend so much time at work with the people you work with. And I wanted to like those people. I wanted to respect those people. I wanted to feel like it's high integrity people who I'm going to enjoy yeah. spending time with. So that was super important, like great CEO, great founding team. And like, of course, I wanted to be on the core team, right? So like, for sure, I was looking for a role where I was reporting to the CEO. And so, you know, liking and respecting those individuals that I'd be around was incredibly important to me. Um, I wanted to be at a startup, but not a super, not a zero to one. I mm. wanted to really be at a growth stage startup because I do, like, I really want to have, I want to be helpful. And I feel like that's where I can help the most. I have a ton of experience yeah. scaling organizations, going from small to over a hundred, and so I thought this is going to be the sweet spot for me where I, I can help the most. Um, it was really important to me that wherever I went was doing novel, exciting engineering work uh, with really talented engineers. So, you know, there's definitely some great startups out there that are maybe like more um, marketing focused and sort of like the engineering team is, is the secondary to uh, kind of 
the story that yeah. they're telling, which is fine, but that's just not the fit that was right for me. I really wanted, I've always gotten so much joy and pleasure from working with super smart engineers and helping them be more effective. So that, you know, super important to me. Um, and then of course, like you gotta say, I want to, wanted to be somewhere that I thought could make it big, right? Like yeah, you're going to go course. on a startup journey. Yeah. You want to feel optimistic <laughs> that it, there's a chance of, of great success, right? That's the, that's the fun of the journey. So, yeah. so, so I wrote down all these criteria, but then I think, you know, at the end of the day, as with many things, like if you're ever buying a, a condo or a house or anything like this, or, you know, decisions about where you, you, you can lead with the logic and you can like sort out the logic yeah. and then emotion kind of, kind of wins. So I, you know, with Sanity, at first I thought, oh, you know, it doesn't make sense. Most of the engineering teams in Europe, I'm here in Denver, but I met the founders. They're all so smart, driven. They're all Norwegian. They're really interesting Norwegians. Uh, the mm. CEO, so intense, so driven, and, and so thoughtful and great about strategy in a way that's really exciting and inspiring. And then the two technical founders, just, just hilarious, smart, creative, kind, but like nerds in the best way, if that yeah. makes sense. And like, that's my people. I was laughing because last year, so one of the founders is called Simon, just a fantastic guy. And my older son is called Simon. And so I have two Simons in my life. One of them was around <laughs> 10 years old and one of them was a full adult. And both of them were like equally excited about Tears of the Kingdom being released and talking to me about Tears <laughs> of the Kingdom. I was like, what is this? I have my two Simons and they're like, <laughs> just so In the engineering council. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think these people, I believe in them and, and they believe in me. So I think we make a great team. We can disagree, which is really important. Um, you know, I think if you're, if you're looking to, to join a company, it's always like, looking at the people you're going to be working with is so incredibly important. And for a startup, the founders, their, their personalities, their intellect, their experience, that's what founds the, the culture of the company, right? You can't, you can't have a culture that doesn't mesh with who the founders are or the leadership team is. So that had to be a fit. So, you know, I met, I met some really great founders who were even new grad, like pretty recent new grads who were like, this was their first company. Yeah. And I think some of them are doing extremely well, but that just didn't feel like a fit for me. Yeah. Right. Whereas this team felt like such a great fit and sanity met, of course, all my other criteria with a phenomenal engineering team, um, doing yeah. really cutting edge, thoughtful engineering work, building novel products that are really appreciated by customers. You know, I also looked at the, um, the, some of the metrics around like churn and so on. And like, you know, got a really good sense that that sanity is appreciated by his customers so yeah. that all you know it all made sense and, and I, after a bunch of time and thought and lots of conversations i was happy to make the leap well i love i loved your approach when you said that you you have to lead with you know rationality with checklists with with criteria yeah. that you write down but then eventually you, you trust your gut, you know, the, the personal feel, the personal feet I'm feeling when you're around with people you would work with. Uh, it's, it's, it's non-negotiable. It's something that totally. if it doesn't, if you feel it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And I mean, I, I've been a CTO and a founder for actually most of my professional life. And some, the, the, I mean, the biggest mistakes I've made in, in hiring, for example, were when I, you know, there were people who, uh, met all the all the uh, all the items of the checklist, you know, but they weren't they didn't click on a personal level. But I I I thought, I mean, this that doesn't matter, you know, because this looks so great. But eventually, you know, the, the there were reasons why these things didn't click. I mean, I think we're able to internalize many uh, ideas in a way that we cannot express immediately, you know, with words. Yeah. Uh, but when we feel good around other people, there, there's a reason yeah. why, and that's what matters the most. Yeah, I agreed. We spend so much time at work. You know, I want to, someone, one of my former team members at uh, GitHub asked me when I was interviewing him about the laugh factor at work. And that's yeah. something that stuck with me of like, yeah, you know, I like to laugh. I like to have a good time. And I, I like, you know, it's, you know, <clears throat> we're doing hard stuff. And, and so that's hard. But it's also our life. And, you know, I don't want to be solemn during my workday. I want to, I want to be able to 
talk and have fun and think about hard stuff. And our CEO yeah. often talks about um, types of fun, type one fun and type two fun. And type one fun is fun when you have in the moment when you're doing it. And type two fun is like running a marathon or something. It's like hard when you're doing it, but like really mm -hmm. satisfying afterwards. And like, I want to have both those types of fun in my Love life. Love that. <laughs> we'll steal it for, yeah. for a newsletter piece or something. Yeah. So before you said something very interesting to me, that is, um, we talked about the different layers of management, how it can easily become bloated. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in your experience at Sanity, uh, you're keeping a team that is much leaner and more flat. Mm -hmm. So uh, w while you were saying that, I was wondering, what are, so there are things that uh, you're bringing at Sanity that you have learned and uh, you have seen firsthand at GitHub and you were able to, yeah. to transfer there. And there are probably things that you, you had to unlearn or do differently because you time. had seen. Yeah. yeah. So how, how was it? Yeah, I think I, I really had to unlearn some of my big company sort of things that I thought were just fully established. And so that's been a really interesting journey. And, you know, thankfully, I have a great team, uh, like I said, I, and I, I mean the leadership team as well as uh, the engineers in my org to help me work through that. And I feel like it's it's been really great. Um, so Sanity has grown now. We have 10 engineering teams and I'm hiring more managers and more ICs. So if, if anyone's interested, please do uh, talk to me. Maybe at some point in this podcast, I can actually talk about what, what Sanity does, which sure, might be interesting. Sure. Uh, but, um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of things that carry over and there's a lot of things that still apply. So for instance, uh, one of the things I noticed when I joined was we have incredibly smart engineers but we didn't have a clear path to what one year or let's say three years looked like. Mm. And so that's something I talked to Magnus, our CEO, and, you know, our other founders was like, I think, you know, for engineers to do their best work, uh, for R&D, we call our, our engineering product and design team, the R&D team, for our R&D team to really be successful, we need to have um, a thoughtful path to like, what are we trying to accomplish? What, what direction are we going in? And can we lay out what that looks like? And so I would say that's something that is a commonality across all engineering uh, teams that I've worked on. It's like knowing where you're going, it's motivating, it increases productivity, it helps you, you know, really, really focus on and all the little decisions that you make every day can sort of align to a bigger goal. So one of the mm. big exercises that we did as a, as a leadership group was a roadmap exercise, which was incredibly fun and motivating, um, really figuring out what our customers need and being intentional about with 10 different teams, you know, you could just work on individual things that all add value, or you could have a more coherent sort of set of things that you're trying to accomplish. And so we built a roadmap with that in mind. And I would say, one of the challenges that Sanity has had is that we bring an enormous amount of value to our customers, but we don't do a super good job of articulating that yeah. to people that we come to, to talk to. So like developers get it. Developers get why Sanity is good and useful. But if you're going to like a CEO at an e-commerce yeah. company, it's hard for them to understand. So some of what we've done in our roadmap exercise is really do it with marketing and sales and like the whole company. We actually queried the whole company to say, what are the things that you think would be game changers for us? And we sort of distilled all that down. Core management made a roadmap and then we sent it back out to teams and said, with this guidance, where would you go? And then we came back up again. So we made kind of a, a plan that then is going to allow us. We had, um, for instance, we had a, kind of all over the place here, but we had a, an event on May 8th, which was the first time that we had, I would say, really good alignment with R&D and marketing where we built certain features to support this event. And um, in that event, we launched a powerful new AI-supported writing experience, which is super exciting. We also launched a complete re-architecture of our CDN, our caching layer, so Sanity was already serving billions of requests a day very efficiently, but we rolled out something we're calling our high-frequency CDN, which is really built to support um, up-to-date content for millions of global users, but also when the content is very dynamic, so changing all the time. 
And so then we had a story with marketing that that made sense. And so we built this roadmap with the idea that we would put coherent stuff together and yeah. build a plan that we could then talk about and help shape our narrative so that customers would then understand what we're doing. And that's something that's new. That part of it is new to me in a startup is like, I've always worked deep in engineering orgs where we're thinking about our features and working with PMs. Uh, but to be working with the sales team and the marketing team on yeah. the leadership team and like, how are we going to make it possible for our customer support engineers to talk to customers about what we're doing? Um, I think that that is one thing, but I do, I do have, you know, a lot of thoughts on, on uh, startups being, being so different from big, big tech and, and kind of having to readjust. Um, I think one of the things I, I really appreciate is that in a startup, we're kind of all on this journey together. So the thing that started to drag me down a little bit in big tech was how you constantly would see local optimization instead of global mm -hmm. optimization. So um, teams making decisions and sort of like, I'm fighting for this headcount for me and I, I want, uh, you know, that team to not get as much headcount so I can have more headcount. Yeah. Whereas when you're in a startup, we're all rowing in the same boat. We're all owners yeah. of the company. We're all trying to accomplish the same thing together. So it's very easy to make decisions quickly in that regard because um, we all want to be successful. Yeah. And I, I think, think, I mean, I, yeah. I've never, I've, I've never worked at the big tech, like a, for about that scale of kind of, that kind of scale. But the way I've always thought from the outset is that it, uh, what, what you said basically is after some, some, some stage of growth, you can't see all together the big picture, the big plan, L like you mentioned, like you said, it, a sanity, right? You work side by side with people from all departments. Yeah. And so you work together towards the common goals. If you are too many teams, too many people, you basically can't do that. So each team is mm -hmm. left on working on their own local optimum. Uh, yeah. and Maybe that's a byproduct of, of, of scale. I, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I think startups have this and smaller teams have this kind of superpower that they can be, when they are focused, they can be really focused in a way that big companies can't. It's so powerful, right? And I feel like big tech, we spent so much time on distractions. I can't even tell you. I feel like we just weren't as aligned on the mission and the focus. Whereas in a startup, you're like, focus is everything. We want to make this work. Um, I felt like, being a manager in big tech became harder and harder for everyone, even the managers of ICs, because it, you know, we had the pandemic, we had so many things going on in the world. And there started to be this expectation that in big, big tech, managers could act as counselors. They yeah. could um, respond appropriately to everything that was happening in the world. And, um, you know, and, and then also managers had to spend a lot of time defending company decisions that were you know, completely out of their hands. Yeah. Um, and so I found like, if I, if I had a graph for how much time in my meetings, I was talking about engineering challenges and technical work versus, you know, these sorts of distractions, Yeah. it was going down and down and down and down. Whereas I think at a startup, I mean, we're all humans. We'll all talk about things that are, we're worried about or that are on our mind, but in general, we're very focused on the work that we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to get done. And, and the distractions are really, really limited because we know we're, we're in a competitive space. Getting features out faster is critical for a growth stage startup. Yeah. We're looking, if you will, for like, how often does a customer lift their head that they're open to changing their infrastructure, right? Like, every few years at best. And so when someone's open to it, you want to have the features ready that are going to pull them in. So, you know, there's that urgency that we feel. Um, and I think that's, that's really exciting in a startup because we are all owners. So we all feel this urgency and we all want to make this work. Um, it means that we can make decisions pretty quickly. I think, you know, another thing I've learned is like in big tech and it's partly due to scale, but it's, it's, it's also, um, you know, it's also a choice in many cases is that a lot of strategy comes bottom up. Whereas in a startup, uh, I'm not scared of top-down strategy. I think top-down strategy is actually great. It's powerful because it gets us great alignment. Yeah. It's really crisp, coherent, really focused on what our customers need. But that doesn't mean that our teams aren't creative. Uh, the strategy is about 
you know, figuring out what our goals are. And then the engineering teams and the, and the product teams have to understand the goals and then use their expertise and creativity to meet the goals. But we're still at a scale where it's possible for leadership to understand the entirety of what's, what's going on. You know, like yeah. when I was at in Google cloud, I think That's it was like 2000 people or more. I don't, I can't remember. No, it was like maybe even like 20,000. It was a huge, huge amount of people. It was like impossible for any single human to know what was going on, but we are still at that scale. So that gives us a huge amount of flexibility. Like yeah. this recent event I was just talking about, we rolled out this high frequency uh, caching layer, really exciting. So like serving up-to-date content really quickly, but then someone had an idea like, okay, that's cool that we can serve fresh con content constantly. And there's use cases that really benefit from that, like in a, in a flash sale uh, for an e-commerce brand, you know, where inventory is going down and you want to swap things around and stuff like having, having a uh, fresh, uh, quickly available content is super important. Um, but that requires sort of the end user experiences that are built, be it the apps or the websites or whatever to, to request that content. And so someone had an idea, we could write a subscription API to go along with this. Mm -hmm. And so we have our, our live content API that allows, uh, you know, sort of like pushing those changes into the end user experiences uh, effectively. And, you know, I think a week before the event, someone came up with that idea and we're like, yeah, let's do it. We can totally do this. And someone was like, I'm going to build a demo uh, to make it work. And, you know, you could just like work really flexibly. And I think in big tech, you would be like, we have already locked in the script and uh, yeah, yeah, has to yeah. go through this many layers of approvals to see like, can, you know, can we make this change? No, this is fun. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. And that's just a super fun culture. And it's, it's um, I think, really powerful to be able to be so reactive and see opportunities and, yeah. and jump on them. And I, and I think you summed up it perf perfectly before when you said the, the, the ability of leaders of um, understand fitting everything that is going on, the entirety and you know, all the product of the company in their head because it's not too much stuff. It's so powerful. Yeah. I mean, when the cognitive load, you know, of everything that is going on, it's, it's not too big that you can fit everything in your head. You can understand everything. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's such a boost because then it's you can do top down to strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Love that. Yeah. Love the story. Yeah. And so Excellent. you said before you're hiring engineering managers, you're hiring engineers. So 100%. let's pitch Sanity, what Sanity does, what Sanity is looking for. You said that it's hard for Sanity to give a good elevator pitch. So it that's is. your sense it is. now. I was thinking you, you might ask me about this. So I was like, oh, I should be ready. <laughs> and uh, we have an excellent CMO. Uh, who joined us, former Datadog, former Salesforce, who is uh, working hard on our elevator pitch and our narrative so that we can sort of um, approach people more easily. But to this sort of more developer engineering focused audience, I will say Sanity is a SaaS company. Um, so we, you know, we have a hosted platform and we have an open source client and an open source query language. And we treat content as data, which um, really allows, you know, in individuals, companies to quickly and easily build novel and highly scalable content experiences. So, you know, in the world of AI, for instance, right, like AI is changing everything, getting more and more and more content. Sanity yeah. is helping you use that content, reuse that content, extend your content with AI across all the different channels that you have, right? So it becomes easy to, um, you know, have an app and a website and let's say an in-store, even a kiosk that all are serving consistent, coherent data. And that you, we sort of help you make sense of all the explosion of content that's out there and, and use it effectively and use your content really as a competitive advantage. So yeah, that's, that's largely what it's about. We have a lot of big customers um, and a huge community, which is, is really fun as well. So we have lots and lots of people using Sanity for free for their, um, you know, their own websites or apps or uh, startups as they're getting started using Sanity. So the, the community is really vibrant. In fact, we are in June uh, hosting a bunch of community meetups in Oslo, Berlin, London, New York, and Toronto. So if anyone's nearby, they should just take a look and sign up. Those are going to be a lot of fun. But um, yeah, we're really enjoying sort of unlocking what's possible for companies when dealing with content. Yeah. So 
a lot of our customers are big e-commerce, but we're also supporting media. We're also supporting product experiences. We have customers like AT&T, uh, Spotify, uh, you know, Puma, Riot Games. Riot Games is doing some really interesting stuff. So yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a lot of fun. And so yeah. I am hiring engineering manager in the US, engineering manager in Europe, um, I'm really looking for uh, front-end engineers right now, so people with great React skills. Um, you know, I mentioned the Eng Council that I set up at GitHub. I set up the same thing at Sanity, and right before our podcast recording, we had a nice conversation about React 19 and what our approach is going to be to, to that. Um, and so, yeah, folks uh, who are, you can search Sanity jobs. There's some great job postings out there. I'm looking for back-end and front-end engineers back-end and front-end managers. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me or look at our jobs page and apply because uh, we're really having a, having a great time and Absolutely. doing some really, I think, novel and useful stuff. And you mentioned that you're hiring in the US and Europe. So is the team uh, remote also, or do you have different spots yeah. in different countries? We are, uh, we are remote first, but we do have a lovely office in Oslo. And so anyone who joins will ultimately end up going to Oslo at some point. I'm going myself in a couple of weeks and really looking forward to summer in Norway. Um, so folks can work from the office in Oslo or remotely. We have folks all over in, in Europe and um, across Canada and the U.S. That's really nice. And by the way, I, I, I use Sanity for toy projects I mean, a while back because now I'm a yeah. full-time writer. I don't have the luxury of an engineering team anymore it was a lot yeah. it was a lovely experience and uh, it's one of those, those things that when you start to use it it clicks immediately you, you immediately mm -hmm. understand the value uh, so especially if you're an engineer if you're a developer you immediately understand so we do really well with developers and developers get it i think yeah our opportunity is really to be able to talk to CEOs and, and other leaders who are not going to be hands-on working in it to really get that value and, and to better articulate that value. So that's definitely part of part of the journey that we're on. Yeah. Yeah. So Rachel, thank you so much for this chat. We covered a lot of ground. I took so many notes. So thank you again for being for being a guest on the on the podcast. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Luca. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this chat valuable, you can subscribe to the show on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Also, please consider giving us a rating or leaving a review, as that really helps other listeners find the show. You can find all past episodes and learn more about the show at refactoring.fm. See you in the next episode.